There we go. Uh, right, hi everyone. Um, just want to uh, introduce the third um, of our webinars um, from Nottingham and Nottinghamshire Integrated Care System End of Life Programme um, for webinar for homes and home care. So Tracy Madge has very kindly agreed to introduce us all today. Good afternoon and uh, firstly uh, just to introduce my job I am the Associate Chief Nurse for the commissioning group which uh, commissions care both in care homes uh, and through the continuing healthcare packages so I know that we've got people joining from care homes, residential homes and the domiciliary care sector and firstly thank you so much for giving up your time this afternoon to join us. We really hope that you'll find this an informative and supportive uh, webinar and we know that you're on the front line and we've heard some of the issues and, and some of the conditions that you're working in and we do we do want to support you in the best way possible but this is an opportunity for you to tell us how we can best support you rather than us telling you what we think so please um, as we go through the webinar we have some fantastic experts uh, both GPs secondary care doctors pharmacists who can answer some of the concerns you may have and Becky will explain to you how to um, pose questions uh, uh, throughout the webinar but I want it to be really interactive but really on behalf of the whole of the, the NHS uh, that surrounds you we consider you part of our family and we want to be there to help you and include you in how we approach and face this pandemic together so thank you for attending and I hope you really enjoy the webinar we've had two really good ones and I'm sure this is going to be equally as good thank you thanks very much um, Tracy that's really helpful so welcome everyone um, we've got 34 attendees with us today um, and, and we've got panelists uh, uh, as well um, so just to run through some of how the webinar will work throughout the webinar you'll get the chance to um, complete some short surveys um, please take part in them um, it's really useful for us to kind of get a good understanding about um, how, how things are going and, and, and what what you think you might need i'm going to launch one now actually so you can see what it looks like um, and it's about the q a process that we've got in place so basically just let us know if you can all see the q a button at the bottom of your screen oh brilliant that's 100 percent yes so far um, so yeah that's really good so if you post your questions um, throughout straight away um, you can put them if they, you have a specific question about um, the presentations we will pause in between presentations to give chance to answer some of those and we've also got a q a session um, at the end. For anyone who can't see them, I think if you maybe just go on to non full screen view, you can see the, the pop up a little bit easier at the bottom of your screen and it just says Q, um, Q and A. Um, so please try and use that. Um, we've put together some information that you might um, find useful and this is based on questions and concerns that have come in via the um, CCG Incident Response Centre. Um, but if there is things you would like us to respond to straight away, then, then start firing them through to us. Um, we'll be focusing on end of life care during the webinar um, and this will last between sort of 60 and 90 minutes. Like I've said, there's a Q&A session um, towards the end, but keep asking those questions throughout. Um, we are recording all of these um, webinars, so the presentations that you see, um, you'll be able to watch them back. We'll circulate this to everyone who's registered for the event. Um, all the polls are, are, are anonymous and you can ask questions anonymously as well if you don't want to pop your name next to them. That's absolutely fine. Um, and then at the end, I will pop up my contact details and a few other key contact details. So if you need to get in touch, um, afterwards about anything or you want to give us any feedback that would be absolutely brilliant right so I think we'll just get cracking we haven't had any questions come in just yet but it looks like nearly everyone can see the um, q and I don't know if any of the panelists if you've got any different view to what I have if some, someone said yesterday they could see the Q&A at the top of their page um, if anyone wants to come in and just offer an alternative view to where the Q&A might be seen no, I think everyone can see it at the bottom. So sometimes you just have to wave your mouse over it and it will pop up. Okay, so right, I think we'll, we'll get going. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you um, for the presentations. So let me just sort that out. So it just takes a minute to come through. 
hopefully you'll all be able to see that now. So we're just on that um, welcome slide. So like I said, it'll be a 60 minute session. We've got question and answers um, and we'll share all these slides at the end. Okay, right. So I'll move you on, I'll hand you over to um, Dr. Bartholomew um, if you want to take it from here. Thank you very much, Becky. Um, once again, thank you very much for joining on the webinar on end of life care in care homes. Uh, I'm Tilan Bartholomew. I'm a GP at Abbey Medical Group, which is in Mid Nottinghamshire, based at Bridworth and Ravenshead. And I'm also the clinical lead for Mid Nottinghamshire Integrated Care Partnership. So I'll start off the webinar by discussing the role of end of life. And we all know good end of life care is integral to what we do as GPs those who have joined us with working closely with care homes and community nursing teams and acute care services. What we know is early identification, early referral to various reserve services makes uh, a good, very effective end of life care for patients, carers and families. In the very first slide, we have uh, the gold standards framework, kind of a pathway or the trajectory of how end of life or, or how the disease or the illness progresses. Generally, if someone has been identified as end of life, whether it's cancer or any other long-term conditions, we expect a deterioration within a few weeks to months, moving on from a green stage to an amber stage to a red stage where there is anticipatory medications and very specialist input. But what we have been faced with COVID is an unprecedented challenge. So what we do know with COVID-19 is that particularly frail elderly patients who are mainly in our care homes can deteriorate rapidly and in fact move on to the red stage, which means that they will need that input and care to in ensure that we identify what their needs are and manage effectively in the community. So if we move on to the next slide, Thank you, Vicky. So ideally, we would have had advanced care plans and, uh, and conversations with the patient or if, in the absence of that with the families and their carers and understood what individual wishes are and have respect forms and everything in place. But due to the very nature of the disease progression and also the escalation of the pandemic, most of us might not have had these care plans or these discussions with patients. So as I said, because it's a clinical condition which deteriorates rapidly, we need to ensure that we have these in place. And also more importantly, we need to have individualized care plans. It, it is not acceptable to have a blanket approach saying all patients based at one care setting or based on a medical condition should be treated this way. It's really important to understand what each individual's wishes are and also what would be the right appropriate management for them. Keeping this in mind, we have worked with the palliative care consultants, geriatricians, GPs, coroner's office, and the medical examiners to devise a, a, a template which we have identified as the emergency deterioration uh, sorry, emergency community, ass so community assessment of the deteriorating patient. I will come to that sl slide in a couple of slides later on, just so that everyone just can see what the slide looks on. Essentially, what this is, is a record of the decision-making process, which enables clinicians, care home nursing staff, community nursing staff to come to the right decision, working with partnerships with patients and their families to understand what would be best interest decisions. We plan to integrate this as part of our electronic records, so this will be clearly visible across different care settings. Next slide, please. So one of the main emphasis of this form is to use the Rockford Clinical Frailty Scale. Some of you may already be familiar with it. And as you can see, this is a way of identifying patient's clinical state two weeks prior to their current acute illness. So it's a score of one to nine, and it's, it, it's quite straightforward. It's just, if you read through that, you circle and identify what stage they were. And it's really important that it's done, it's having an assessment of what they were two weeks before they deteriorated. There is a couple of caveats. One, it should not be used under the age of 65. And also it should not be used for anyone with a stable long-term conditions, such as learning disabilities autism or cerebral palsy. If we move back to the previous slide, Becky. So 
as I said, this can be done by GPs, and it's mainly intended to be done by GPs and out of our GPs, but we will, this can also be done by the community nursing staff, care home nursing staff and paramedics. It does not replace any existing advanced care plans or respects, in fact, complements it. And any existing advanced care plan wishes or things documented in the respect forms can be included in this form. We expect the forms to be kept in both GP's clinical records, keep a copy at the care home and any community nursing records. So there is that visibility and we do not accidentally do an intervention which is against the patient's wishes. So I think the final slide is just a slide about what the form looks like. So two slides down. So that it's two sides of an A4 page. Uh, we will get this integrated into our clinical record systems. Uh, it, it shouldn't be too onerous at all. You know, it's uh, quite straightforward for a clinician to fill and we will offer some training as we go along with this. So I will answer some questions at the end. So it will be really good to know if you are, already have experienced this and any further questions regarding the process. Thank you, Becky. There you go. Sorry, I have my mute button on. Um, so if you want to start sending any questions through uh, about that, that would be great. I'm just going to launch a poll um, so you can let us know some of your thoughts. Um, no one's asked any questions yet, but uh, if you start putting those through, that would be great. OK, so we're just going to move on to um, our next presentation then while we're waiting for for questions. So um, we're going to talk about respect uh, and the principles around this next. So I think I'm handing over to Carl next. Hi, I'm Carl Ellis. I work in Mid Knots as part of the End of Life Care Together programme. And we are part of a team that is uh, rolling out respect across all the health and social care sectors. So therefore, it's, it's, it's right that we start to uh, in, engage with our uh, care home colleagues in actually launching the respect tool. Um, respect is a nationally recognised best practice tool in identifying the wishes and preferences of, of, of patients, as Tillan has already alluded to. Um, it's a great way of actually identifying how a patient wants to be cared for in the, in the future with regards to whether they want to prioritise life-sustaining uh, care or whether they want to prioritise comfort care. It's a document really that um, is, uh, is very, it might, may well be familiar to, to you in the care home in terms of how you actually, uh, the com kind of conversations you're already having with your residents in, in, in the way that you're actually developing your own advanced care plans. So we hope that there is a natural synergy to what you're already doing to how you actually start to implement this document. The actual document itself, um, there are Lots of uh, excellent training uh, records that go with the um, with respect, and I really would advocate that everybody download the uh, the app um, on on the respect because there's lots of excellent um, training tools and webinars and uh, lots of different question and answer sessions on there. And I would really recommend that you actually uh, use that because it's really great. And it's and the link's actually on the uh, on the slide that you can see, and that will get you through to that. And I've also added. Um, and appendices to, the sl to these slides. There's about 10 slides that actually goes through the different elements of how to complete the respect form. So again, you know, if, if you want to, it, it's there as an aid memoir. Um, so as I say, because uh, the respect form has already been implemented uh, across uh, some health and social care sectors and it's already been rolled out in the hospitals, for instance, you may have already seen some respect forms come out with your residents when they've been discharged from hospital or uh, new residents that have come into the home where they've come from uh, the community. So uh, you may already be familiar, but it is very much that individualised care plan. It's the opportunity for the patient to express what their future care wishes are when their illness deteriorates, and sorry, their condition deteriorates, and the illness means they can no longer make, uh, make uh, decisions on their own. It's a way of them actually recording that in a, in a really informative way, uh, and one that uh, is then recognised across the different sectors. Um, in terms of respect itself, uh, one of the things that we really advocate that we're actually trying to move away from a, a, a singular resuscitation conversation. It's much more around actually exploring um, what the, the 
and the future wishes and preferences are rather than just a, a one conversation about respect, which is what the old DNA CPR forms um, did. They only concentrated on one small area. At least this is now looking more holistically at the individual and what they actually want for their future care. In terms of how long it takes to complete, um, generally it takes around about an hour to complete uh, the actual conversation with the resident actually working through the actual form itself and um, the time actually takes in sharing that information and i think that's the key thing about the respect form because it has been so widely accepted across the different uh, organizations and we have the actually actually have the opportunity to share this document in a way that uh, um, where um, something would happen, like if the ambulance was called, then the other organisations will respect the respect form. And that's the key part of this, really. So it's the sharing the information that actually takes the time. But please, um, you know, follow that process because it's, it's the key part to, uh, to the respect process. And uh, we have the opportunity to be able to record the respect forms in GP surgeries and actually make them available to the different parts of the health sector. So that if a patient does then go to hospital, for instance, it is visible in the ED department. There are obviously obvious advantages in using respect where we're looking at COVID as well. Well, although the uh, you know Tillan's already alluded to the fact that the uh, the time frame for for COVID the deterioration is is much quicker than what we normally expect with end of life care, it is an opportunity for residents to actually express what their future care care needs are and how they would actually like to be cared for. And so, therefore, you we you know you can use that as an opportunity if it's if it's available uh, with the time frame that you've got. It is a paper document, it's, it's two sides of, of an A4, um, and there are lots of different printed versions of that, um, uh, that document that we, we can uh, distribute out to, to care home colleagues. Um, there is also a, a, a writable PDF version that I can actually uh, send to colleagues if, if that's what they actually would like, and if they want to send me uh, if they want to send a request either through uh, through Becky or, or direct to myself um, for the writable PDF, I, I can email that out. One question that does often come up is, does it have to be in colour? No, it doesn't. It can be in black and white if, if that's, uh, that's the only uh, access to printing that you have. But we do always advocate that we try and uh, ensure that it is, the, um, it, it is the original signature that's actually on the document itself. Uh, and where possible, that that original document remains with the, with the resident um, throughout their care. We've got quite a lot of um, questions come in, uh, Carl. So it might be it might be worth to, to go through them if that's all right. So um, the first yep. one, the first one there is: um, Are care home nurses able to complete the respect forms now? So in terms of in terms of completing the respect form, anybody can actually start the respect form in in the relevant sections where you're having the conversations um, with uh, with residents. In terms of actually signing the, uh, the, the DNAR section, the resuscitation section, if we do that as part of an MDT, then we can actually work with uh, uh, GP colleagues and community nursing colleagues to ensure that the, uh, the document is actually uh, recorded in a, in a centralised place. I don't know what the, um, the individual uh, organisational rules are uh, within your care homes around the signing of DNA CPRs, but I would certainly suggest that the best way forward is to work with um, GP, uh, GP surgeries and uh, community care, community nursing colleagues to ensure that the, the conversation is shared and that obviously there's a joint decision making in that. Okay, thank you very much. I'll just run through a couple of these other ones. So we've had um, uh, another question on Restore2, but I'll put that to um, Eddie shortly. Um, yep. So I'm just going to go through to the next one. So someone's asked, um, it's Tracy that's asked this, Will this form replace the DNA CPR form or use in conjunction with it? Well, so DNA CPR is a section on the respect form. Um, where a patient has a DNA CPR form, what we'd advocate is that actually that, that decision remains, uh, remains applicable. What we're saying is that actually use the respect form in, in conjunction with that. So you can, you, can have, you can have both forms. However, what we'd like to see is that eventually the, the DNA CPR forms are phased out and we, and we move on to, on to respect. Um, and of course, if you've got a DNA CPR form and then you're doing the respect, because the, the decision's already made, been made, you can follow it through and actually complete it on the respect form itself. And again, 
just you know it's, it's it's about following up it's about reviewing that respect form reviewing that dna cpr decision at that time and therefore uh, recording it then with your uh, with your gp colleagues fabulous thank you very much um another one that's come in then is um it says i'm hearing that care home staff should be starting to complete respect forms is that correct Absolutely. So the respect process, and I probably should have gone through this, doesn't all have to be completed in one in one go. It's actually it's designed to be incremental. So it, it, will, it may be started, for instance, in the hospital. And then the expectation is, is that when the patient is then discharged, that the care home kind of pick up the mantle and complete the different elements because um, or, or if it has been fully completed that it's actually reviewed and that would be the same um, for, for residents if you're residents at the moment I would advocate you starting to see that um, you, you're starting the conversation around, re around respect filling in the relevant sections and then having conversations with your colleagues around uh, the, the completion of the process. Okay so we've had a, an, another comment sort of related to that um, and it, it just says um, not finding community nursing staff willing to complete them so we are, I am part of a, a, a team that's going to be working with, with um, care homes. Um, it's a service of being led by uh, Lorraine Palmer, who's part of our integrated care partnership and, the, and is part of the integrated care system. Um, and we are looking to see, bring together uh, care home colleagues with uh, community nurses um, so that we can actually uh, get over this particular situation and bring together virtual NDTs um, between the care homes and the uh, and primary care colleagues so that we can actually ensure that the, the decision that has been made, so the conversation that you've had in the care home with your residents, that that is then uh, communicated and accepted and implemented across. Yeah, okay, that's great, thank you. So I think I think you've sort of answered that um, the concern has just been raised that it's, it's mainly just GPs in, 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 in the, uh, the questioner's uh, patch, um, but I think you've gone through that, so um, obviously ask again if I've not got that right but um, there's another question here saying will that be the same for the and form and will it be replaced by respect? Yes so the allow natural death form um, again it's 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 very similar to the uh, the DNA CPR process. We would hope that that would get phased out. So when I when I say phased out, obviously if you've already had the conversation, you're gonna you're gonna maintain the form, but review the uh, review the decision, and that eventually we transfer everything over onto respect because it's all then in one place. Okay, brilliant. Um, so there's a couple more. If any of the other panelists want to come in on these, then feel free to. Um, additionally, you can type the answers um, as well so that everyone can then see them. So um, we've still got another question. It just says here, have I got it right that anyone can complete the form, but a medical professional would need to sign the DNA CPR section? Is that right? Absolutely. So what we advocated is that um, the key worker, uh, the person that's, that's the, sorry, that w who works with the residents, if they if they are the person that's having the conversation, that they can document the um, the outcome of that conversation. The completion of the form is then almost done at that MDT level, um, so that we we're taking the relevant sections of that conversation and, and putting it in the right place. So it, the com you know, the the respect form might be started by uh, somebody in the care home and then completed as part of the MDT. Brilliant. Okay, so there's still a few more there, Carl. So what I'll ask you to do is if you go on to the questions and just type the answers to them, everyone will be able to see the typed answers then. Um, so I'll just move us on for now. Um, obviously, if there's still outstanding questions, we'll come back to them at the question and answer session um, towards the end. So um, what I'll do is I'll move us on to our next presentation, uh, which I'm handing over to Eddie, I believe, and this is on Restore 2. Hi Becky, thank you. Good afternoon everyone. So I'm Eddie Older, I'm the Head of Patient Safety at East Midlands Patient Safety Collaborative and I'm going to be talking to you a bit about Restore2 this afternoon and we're working with colleagues across the CCGs um, and in Nottingham Training Hub to help support you in adopting and using Restore2 if it's a tool that you think is going to be useful for you. So key things to say about Restore2, first of all, it, it's a tool that could be helpful to care homes, nursing homes and domiciliary care settings. So wherever you're from on this call, then hopefully you will find something of use in this. It's also a tool that can be used well with older people, but also people with other care needs, such as people in learning disability establishments or mental health care homes. Um, so again, has wide reach across the system. 
Um, Restore 2, some of you may be familiar with because it's recently been discussed quite a lot in the British Geriatric Society guidance for care homes in responding to COVID. And that guidance was authored by Professor Adam Gordon at the University of Nottingham and Anita Peat from Wren Hall Nursing Home, um, who are obviously both local to our system. So it has got some, some really um, influential local support. Restore2 is a tool that we've been working with in the Patient Safety Collaborative for the last year or two, and we've been testing um, this tool with care homes. And as a consequence, we've got a number of learning resources, videos, workbooks that have been co-produced with care homes to hopefully help support you and meet your needs and implement and restore. So what is it and why is it important? It's important at the moment because, as, as you'll all appreciate, we're seeing increasing numbers of patients experiencing physical deterioration in all settings. Restore 2 will help you identify when a resident or a, a service user may be showing early signs of deterioration. And it'll also help you to communicate that and to escalate that to GPs, to 111, to ambulance services and acute trusts in a way that can be understood and heard. We're not just working with care homes to roll this work out. We are also working with mental health hospitals, with prisons, with ambulance trusts. So the idea is that everybody will be talking a common language and these will become very familiar in between each service. There are three elements to restore to. The first level or layer, if you like, are soft signs of deterioration. So when a patient begins to become unwell, they often show early signs. That might include being less mobile, having a lower appetite, not going to the toilet as often as they usually do, having difficulty communicating. And these are the things that yourselves as experienced care workers in different settings do every single day. You notice these things day in, day out, report them to one another. So this isn't asking you to do anything that we know you're not capable of. This is a part of your, your key delivery. All it's asking is that you begin to capture that information in a way that can be helpfully communicated so that when patients change from their usual day-to-day -day position, um, you can get that across to the people that need to hear that and understand it. So I have every confidence that everyone on this call can do the soft science element of Restore2 and we can give you extra tips and support in order to help you that get there. The second layer then, if you have concerns about a patient's soft signs, is to record a new score or national early warning score. Now this might be more challenging and it might feel a little bit daunting to some staff because this includes recording some physical observations such as blood pressure and pulse oximetry readings and that might not be something that you do every day of your working life. We have a number of resources and videos to help you through that but the important thing to say about news is don't be put off if you can't do every aspect of it. The bits of news that you can do might be enough to demonstrate that a patient's experiencing a deterioration. So there is something called incomplete news and homes that maybe haven't got experience in taking blood pressures or haven't got the equipment to do it can still submit an incomplete news as long as you state that's what it is and we can use that to helpfully escalate and find you the appropriate response for that resident's needs. And then the final phase is SBARD. SBARD is just a structured way of structuring your communications to others but it's a proven evidence-based way to make sure that your message gets heard. And one thing we're seeing and hearing quite a lot in some of the Facebook chat groups, the WhatsApp chat groups um, of care homes, is that it's that communication being heard that can be difficult. So we think this will be quite helpful to you. So our offer to you is to provide direct support and training support. We can do this online, we can do it over the telephone. Um, we've got lots of different resources that we can share with you. Um, we can tailor that to meet your needs. So for that purpose, we've set up a single email address that you can contact and then we'll come back to you and help you on a one-to-one -one basis. If we find we're hearing lots of the same questions from you, then we'll develop things like frequently asked questions, tools that we can circulate to you, or we'll put on additional events and webinars to respond to that need. Um, so I think really that, that's all I need to say, but I'm happy to sort of pick up any questions if there's anything coming through on the chat. Yep, thank you very much. There are a couple of questions. So uh, I think one's previously been asked and answered, but it's sort of, it's around Restore 2 and the Mini Restore, um, as it's similar and useful. It says, will this replace and be the same tool like the Wessex tool? 
Okay, so yeah, perhaps didn't cover this actually today. So mini restore is essentially the soft science element and the communication element, the SRD, without the news. So that's one of our options available to you. If you're not confident with doing the physiological observations, we can keep that bit out of it and you can complete what's known as a mini restore. Also, you might already be using a different soft science tool. So I know there's a number of homes in Nottinghamshire that use Significant 7 or Stop and Watch or various other tools. There's absolutely no need to stop doing that and replace it with the soft science tools from Restore 2. We can work with what you're already comfortable using. In terms of, is it the same as Wessex? Yes, so Restore 2 grew out of Wessex and the West of England. So the resources and the core structure of Restore 2 is exactly the same. It's standardized across the country and it's been widely rolled out now across care and nursing home settings um, and all 15 patient safety collaboratives across the country are currently um, supporting the local systems to adopt Restore 2. Brilliant. There's just one other and it says, will Restore2 be available to use electronically? Okay, so that is a work in progress. So at the moment, it's largely done paper based. There are some pieces of software that pick up similar elements, so some of the soft science elements, and there are also digital versions of news. So nationally across the patient safety collaboratives, we're currently identifying the best practice in terms of recording Restore2 digitally and in a way that that's interoperable. So if a care home does it digitally, can it be shared digitally with GP practices, community services, et cetera? We are looking to run a rapid demonstrator. So we're working in par partnership with a private company here to run a rapid demonstrator in the East Midlands in care homes over the next few weeks. Um, and then hopefully we will have that product development done and ready to roll out and where that rolls out it will roll out with essential equipment to undertake observations um, a full online platform and a training platform to accompany it so watch this space there is something very rapidly being developed that i hope will be available to you in the near future brilliant thank you very much well i'll just pause for a moment there just to see if anyone wants to put any more questions through um i had launched a poll during that which uh, we've had a really good response to so thanks very much for that um, the next presentation that we've got is um, on medicines management, so I will be handing over to Coral. So if you just want to introduce yourself, that would be really good. Thank you, Becky. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Coral Osborne, the um, Associate Chief Pharmacist um, for the Nottingham and Nottinghamshire CCG. Um, three elements that I just wanted to briefly touch um, over, sorry, touch with you um, this afternoon. Um, it's around prescribing guidelines, access to medication, and finally, just a little bit around what support we might be able to provide to you as a medicines optimization team. So um, in terms of prescribing guidelines, um, there's obviously lots of national guidance kind of coming through all the time, but we have actually produced our own like local prescribing guideline. Um, and this is in line with national guidance, but has also importantly had some input from um, our local palliative care teams as well within secondary care, as well as GP input as well. It's part of our end of life toolkit um, and people can actually access it also through uh, the Nottingham Area Prescribing Committee website. I should say that the primary aim of this um, guideline was to make sure that um, routes were kept as simple as possible in terms of administration because this particular guideline is not just for care homes it's also it's for all community settings so it's for um, for people in their own home that might be being cared for by their own family um, or for carers that might be working within home care agencies we particularly wanted to make sure um, that simple routes of administration were also used because that that also leaves um, the more um, the second line options of things like injectable um, medications. It leaves those um, for us to use um, for more serious cases, but also allows us to keep an eye on making sure that the medicine supply chain for medicines um, isn't disrupted at all. Um, finally, just to say that that particular piece of guidance also includes a patient information leaflet um, for carers around things like sublingual or rectal administration, which they might not routinely um, you know, be used to actually giving via those routes. 
The next slide, please, Becky. There you go. Thank you. So in terms of access to medications, obviously what's really important is that once anything's prescribed, that we can get this um, medication to um, these patients as quickly as possible. So we have been in contact and negotiations and discussions with community pharmacies, and that is to make sure that those prescriptions are prioritised by community pharmacies. Um, we've also been working with the volunteer sector also to see if we can get volunteers to support um, particularly um, care homes um, so they don't have to send their own staff out to collect medication. Um, so linking up with the volunteer sector to do that. One of the main questions we've had over the last couple of weeks is can care homes in particular keep stocks of anticipatory medication? Now, the current answer to that is still no. And the reason for that is because we've been very aware that we need to make sure and maintain supplies of medication. And if we have stocks of medication in lots of different sites, then that obviously runs the risk of us um, um, getting reduced amounts of medication or access to medication. How we can support this though, is that in terms of community pharmacies, we've got a number of dedicated community pharmacies um, across the county who through a local enhanced service will keep um, a set um, amount of end of life medications. Um, we're also in discussion with our out of hours providers and our community sector as well to be keeping um, increased stocks of medication in those locations and also our trust pharmacy at the Queen's Medical Centre. It's also worth pointing out that um, we are expecting some national guidance around reusing um, medication and in particular control drug medication. Um, so what I would be saying to um, care homes at the moment is if you do have some supplies in your controlled drugs cabinet that um, are sadly um, for a patient that might have passed away, then please keep these in your cabinet at the moment. Don't destroy them as it's likely that we may be able to, to reuse them. Could I have the next slide please, Becky? Absolutely. There we go. Okay, so finally, I just wanted to finish off by saying, um, obviously, within our medicines team, um, we've got a number of pharmacists and technicians that have got a lot of experience working with care homes. Um, so these staff are available um, to help care homes in particular and also home care providers. And we can do this safely and remotely. And I've just put up on the slide a couple of the areas where we are able to assist with. What we're particularly looking at at the moment is around supporting homes potentially with um, patients potentially discharged from hospital or medication reviews. Um, there also is the possibility that we could um, support homes with um, medication ordering processes as well. Okay, thank you very much. We've got some contact details at the end um, of the slide set about who you could contact if, if care homes were particularly interested in having some support from us. Thank you. That's brilliant. Yeah, thanks very much, Carl. That's, that's really good. So there's no open questions at the moment. Um, but obviously, if, if you do have any further questions that occur to you during the rest of the presentations around meds management, fire them through um, or anything else, that'd be really good. I launched a poll, um, which I've had a really good response to. Thank you very much. So it looks like um, some additional information on meds management uh, around end of life care would be really useful. So we're, we're currently looking at that. So that's really helpful to know. Um, I'm going to move us on then to our next presentation, which is around um, verification of death. And I'm handing over to Dr. Christina Sharkey, I believe. Hello, um, I'm uh, Christina Sharkey. I'm a GP in Daybrook and also a Macmillan GP for City Care and for the Nottinghamshire area. Um, so we'll just spend the next few slides just looking at the processes um, that will ensure that when our patients die and it's an expected death, that things move, move um, smoothly for them. Um, clearly, you know your patients really well and you're going to be the ones that will spot early maybe those soft signs that will spot that they are deteriorating um, and then you'll be assessing the situation and assessing their needs and liaising with the GP and the community nurses in doing that. 
Um, and it's key that if we recognise that somebody may die as a result of their deterioration, um, that we are putting lots of things in place. Um, so first of all, um, recognising that they may die, communicating that with the, the, the family um, so that everybody's up to speed, um, thinking about what the needs for that individual are, do we need to provide medication um, in an alternative route? So if they can't swallow their medication, have we got medication available that can be given subcutaneously? Um, and my colleague has produced a pre-authorization form that I'll show you in the, in the next slide and we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, clearly you'll be monitoring your patients um, closely um, and ensure producing an individualized plan of care to ensure that symptoms are managed um, quickly and appropriately and patients are comfortable. Um, and once that death occurs, um, we'd encourage that the verification happens by the individuals who are already involved in that patient's care, um, if they're sort of confident and competent to do that. Um, and then you'll be informing either the GP surgery or 111 um, or of that death. Um, and, and if everything's sort of expected and everything in place, then hopefully then there should be the smooth transition then and hand over to the funeral director. Next slide, please, Becky. Um, this is just to share um, a template that one of my colleagues, Julie Barker, has put together. So um, if, you're, if you've, it's been recognised that somebody may pass away, then it's important that it's documented within the records that it's expected that this patient may die. Um, one of the ways that this could be done would be using uh, this template. It could be completed by the nurse or, or, or a doctor um, on following a discussion, recognising that somebody may pass away. It's a, it's a place to collect that important information regarding that patient, you know, whether there's particular needs, special things that need to happen after death. And then at the point of death, um, carers can record the verification process on this form as well. Um, and then it can be, um, it, it can then be handed over to the funeral directors. Um, Obviously, I think there's some questions gone out about sort of verification of death. And obviously, we want to know if there are particular needs in this area, training needs around that area. So please do fill in that questionnaire. Next slide, please, Becky. Thank you. Um, so I'm sure you're all really familiar, but there are a number of signs that sort of people could be potentially dying. And to remember that in most cases, dying is actually a peaceful process. And there may be sort of gradual loss of appetite, um, patients becoming more fatigued, taking to their beds, you know, difficulty swallowing their usual medication, um, difficulty eating and drinking, you know, skin changes becoming cool, becoming more sleepy, less responsive, and there may be erratic bleeding, breathing. Um, but it's uh, in, in COVID, we do know that that sort of dying process that in many cases often happens gradually, things can happen a lot more quickly. Um, but the important thing is, you know, not to panic, um, to go back to our sort of basic principles of uh, assessing our patients, seeing what their needs are, um, communicating where we think they're at, liaising with the, the family and supporting the family in caring for them. Um, and, you know, you don't have to do this alone. You can seek help from a senior, from a GP um, as needed. And, you know, as long as we go back to what are, what's important to our patients, what have they told us before in their conversations and their priorities, as long as we're keeping that in the centre, then hopefully we can't go wrong. Um, just, I'll share this final slide that Julie put together, um, just um, showing um, on the left hand side the sort of process for um, an expected death. And as I say, it might be this that you've had a conversation, you've noted that the, the GP and nurse are in agreement that the patient could die as well as this deterioration. It might be that the pre-authorization template has been completed. 
It might be that you've had discussions before about people being on the gold standards framework register or the electronic palliative care system and it's been recognised that they're either in the amber stage and in the amber stage we say people are expected to perhaps have a week's prognosis but in the red stage days prognosis um, or it might be that they've had already had special patient notes completed suggesting that a patient um, you know is expected to die and all that forms good evidence so that you know that when that patient passes away unless something very untoward occurs that that can be treat, treated as an expected death the verification process of death um, can happen um, the appropriate notification and then smooth transition to the funeral director um, just to show you that the, the other side there clearly if things are unexpected and sudden then a different course of action needs to happen Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. So we, we have got, um, I think we had a couple of questions come in. So one's been answered, um, but there's one uh, that's just asking, where do we access the pre-authorisation templates? Um, I think, that, could that be made available, Becky, for um, people attending? Yeah, we can, we can send them out, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure actually whether it was involved, it was within the documentation on TNET either. So perhaps that's something we could look into. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So we will be, um, all of the questions and answers that have um, happened during these three, we will be sharing all of those. So so that will be logged and we'll send out that documentation with Thank that. Thank you. So that's, yep. can, oh, yeah. I, can I just interrupt? I think we can send it out to everybody. There's, a, there's another question that's come in, but um, what I'd suggest is that, um, we actually make sure that the pre-authorisation forms are sent to every care home and we can uh, make sure that that's done from the CCG. Yep. Okay, that's great. Um, Thanks, Tracy. Who can train in verification of death? It's got to be a qualified um, clinician, so a doctor, paramedic or nurse. Uh, that's my understanding, unless any of the panellists uh, have got any other different understanding. That's the law. They are looking at funeral directors being trained in this, but that is currently not legal. I think I think if there are um, carers within a care home who've had the appropriate training, um, then that then that's also acceptable. Um. It's about confidence and competence. So if you've got a member of staff, whatever level of um, education they've had, if they are competent and confident to verify death, they absolutely can do that. Verification in law doesn't exist. Certification is entirely different. So verification is just about recognising that somebody has actually died. That's all it means, that you've checked that they have actually passed away. So it really is about staff being competent and confident to be able to do that. And we will look to get some training around verification of death for those services that feel that they really need it. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, OK, so we've got another presentation then. This next one's around inf uh, infection prevention and control. Uh, I'm going to be handing across to Sally Bird. Um, we've got no open questions at the moment, so um, do use that function as, uh, as and when those questions occur to you. But for now, I'm hand handing across to Sally. Hello everybody, I'm Sally Bird, Head of Infection Prevention and Control Service for Nottingham and Nottinghamshire CCGs. Um, I've put together some brief slides um, to address the main questions that we are getting asked when we're supporting care homes, but I do appreciate that there may be further questions that you have, um, so you can use the chat function for this. Um, we are reliant on the Public Health England guidance to inform our decision making and this is changing all the time and I know that this is causing some frustrations out there um, because we're all used to just getting one document that we use for a long time um, and we all work to it but we're having to adapt to this um, very rapidly changing um, situation. Um, we're all learning all the time about this virus and that's why Public Health England need to keep frequently changing um, their guidance um, and I do know that's causing um, problems. Precautions for end of life care are the same as for other residents in a care home and they're based on a risk assessment and this would include home care providers as well. Precautions are focused on reducing the risk to staff and carers from droplet transmission or, or infection and the risk of spread from COVID positive cases comes from the virus in the respiratory droplets um, this can be easily spread from patients coughing the virus into the air and then these droplets can be breathed in by others or they can land on surfaces contaminating the environment. 
And if we then touch those droplets on surfaces and then touch our nose or mouth, we can be infected. And that's why hand hygiene is so important. The current new national recommendations are based on high levels of new COVID cases being identified in the community now. And all residents and patients should be considered to be potentially infectious unless the risk assessment determines that this is low. Um, and this change is due to many cases testing positive who don't have the expected symptoms, particularly in the elderly. So they may not have a temperature, they may not have a cough, they may just present as being lethargic or having lost their sense of taste. And some of these residents may fall and then they're getting admitted to hospital and the test is showing that these patients are positive. This has meant that it's become really difficult to know who does and who doesn't have this virus. And because of that, Public Health England has made some recent changes around the precautions that we need to take. In most cases, this will mean that staff will need to wear a surgical mask if working within two metres of a person, even if they're not touching them. The table on the right shows precautions needed for close contact personal care. Masks are worn, are all, um, goggles and visors are worn for a session now, so they can be worn whilst providing care for more than one patient because they're not actually in touch with the patient. Gloves and aprons remain single use. The session is considered to be over a shift, but if you take a break during this time and your PPE is removed or it should become damp or contaminated, then our advice is that it would need replacing. I think there are um, occasions where if people are short that public health England have suggested that this may be safe to be stored uh, between use but I think whilst um, equipment is available uh, our advice is it would be replacing. Care must be taken not to wear uh, not to touch your mask and visor if these are continued to be worn. We appreciate that PPE is a big concern for all of you and I suggest that regular review of stops and use of disruption line if usual suppliers are not available um, is used to keep uh, making sure that you have enough stops um, to keep your staff safe. Next slide please Becky. Infection prevention and control precautions must be applied after death as there is still an ongoing risk and staff need to remain protected wearing PPE when caring for the deceased. And this would also apply if you have a next of kin present as well. And um, they will need to be supported um, with taking those precautions and ensuring that they take um, contact do high hand hygiene as well. Next slide, please, Becky. Cleaning is really important, particularly if you have been caring for a COVID positive person. And uh, the virus can survive for a long time in the environment up to a minimum of at least three days on hard surfaces with less time on metal and soft furnishings. But again, we're learning about this virus all the time. The good news is it's actually quite easy to remove the virus with good cleaning um, and detergent is very effective at getting rid of this virus. When cleaning a room, it's important that the person going in has all their equipment ready before they enter the room. The windows should be open to help ventilation because they will be using a chlorine based product for disinfection purposes. The deep cleaning pro process advised is the same cleaning needed after more common infections such as diarrhea and vomiting illnesses. You will need to clean and then disinfect. So this should be a relatively familiar cleaning regime for care home staff to follow. So I'm not going to go through this slide in detail. For home care, there may be some slight variations because you may not have access to the soluble laundry bags that care homes use. And the advice is to wash any linen on, it, on its own in a hot wash if suitable and to perform hand hygiene after handling any linen. Waste should be double bagged and stored for 72 hours and it can then be disposed of in a normal waste bin. There's so much guidance around and these are just a couple of key pieces of information. Further advice is available on the Public Health England .gov website. And I just want to say that the care home staff and carers are all doing a fantastic job. My team are regularly in contact with care homes and you are 
having really, really difficult, um, with a really difficult situation at times. And, um, you know, we really, really do appreciate that you are doing a fantastic job. Um, and I just want to say that when we, uh, or when I and my team clap on a Thursday, we're clapping for you for all the great work that you're doing out there. So thank you. There we go, I'll unmute. Thanks very much uh, for that, Sally. We've got a few questions. Oh, sorry, Tracy. Is that you, Tracy? I can't really hear you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So I was about to say there's some questions for Sally. Yep. Yeah, I've got them. Brilliant. So I'll just run through these with you now, Sally. So it says here, should residents with COVID wear a mask when carers are in the room? Um, so I know when um, patients are being seen in some of the COVID centres that they are being asked to wear a mask. Um, the general guidance isn't suggesting that residents would wear a mask um, in care homes because it's their home. Um, and I think it will depend very much on what the symptoms are. Many of the residents that we are being told about in care homes don't actually, they're not a lot of them are coughing and not all having the typical symptoms. So I think that's down to the um, care home to determine if they've got a resident that is um, coughing profusely, but is able to wear a mask and you have the stops to be able to provide that, then um, it is a possibility, but it's not in guidance and it's not something that is um, generally recommended. I think there have been occasions where care homes have had um, residents with dementia who are very difficult to isolate in their rooms, are testing COVID, COVID positive and have a cough and for some of those cases um, in the absence of being able to actually isolate them easily um, if they are able to tolerate wearing masks when those are available that has been a suggestion but it's not um, it's not uh, it's not a general rule. That's great thank you so there's a couple more uh, the next one says what do you recommend for carers in the community in regard to um, visits, I think, um, to ensure no cross-contamination between service users? So I'm not very clear, is that home care? I'm not sure, is that home care providers or community nurses? It's, um, um, okay, I'll just, I'll read it out again. I think it's, so, so carers in the community it says what do you recommend for carers in the community in regard to visits to ensure no cross contamination cross contamination between service users so i think this is just um, about carers it's advisors oh, is it advisors do you know it's it's me not reading thank you very much yes in regard to visors sally <laughs> oh so visors of cross contamination so, yeah. um, so there are some visors that are out there that are um, disposable visors, but I know a lot of them are being reused um, and some of them are suitable for this purpose. So where um, uh, care staff are using reusable visors, uh, they should have something like a um, cleaning and disinfection wipe. So something like a universal uh, wipe that does a two in one. So there are various uh, products available that do that um, and uh, they, sh they should be cleaned um, after leaving um, the patient and then they can be um, uh, reused for, uh, the next, to go to the next visit. Okay that's great thank you. So there's another one here and it says if we have no suspected cases within staff or residents uh, with a care home should I be ensuring all staff still wear a mask when working? Is it more advisory or optional in this case? So the guidance that was issued, I think, later on Friday last week, on the 17th, uh, how to stay safe in a care home. I think, uh, I think page four has got a frequent yes question section, which does say if, if uh, no, there are no staff and no residents that have had any symptoms and have not had COVID, um, and if the uh, manager uses the risk assessment on page 10, which is at the back of the document, uh, I think there's a section there that says if there have been no cases in the home, no staff with any symptoms, you're having minimal people come into the home, you may determine that your uh, home has got a minimal risk of this, in which case you may decide that staff uh, don't need to wear 
the masks um, if they're just uh, not in close contact with the residents. Um, that's down to a local risk assessment. I think uh, we are seeing a lot of homes now that have got COVID positive cases. They have had cases in staff that have been tested. Um, and I think because we are seeing residents who are not presenting with the typical signs, so they're not having a temperature, they're not having a cough, I think it makes it really difficult to know who's got this virus. So I think if you're in any doubt at all, I would err on the side of caution and keep your staff safe by asking them to wear a surgical mask that they can use for a session. So they don't have to keep changing it between patients. Great. So there's quite a few more that have come in, Sally. Can I ask you to kind of type the answers to them? Um, I, I mean, I think your, your response has answered one that we've had in from um, Kelly, but if you could have a look at them and type the answers, we'll move on. And if there's st still any outstanding at the end of the session, um, we'll, we'll involve them in the um, Q&A section. Is that all right? I think there is one question there about orange bags. Um, oh, yeah. and, I heard, and I heard yesterday, orange bags are the clinical waste bags. And I am aware that there are issues in getting those. Um, I don't absolutely have an answer to that because I, um, I, I don't, we don't have stocks of those. I know where homes are double bagging. One of the suggestions is that you can use a different bag and then put it into an orange bag if you're running short of these. Um, but it is, um, but, um, but I'll, I'll certainly, it's something we can see if we can find out about because I only heard yesterday that some areas are, are struggling to get hold of the orange waste bags. Okay, thank you. That's really useful. Uh, right, so I'm I'm going to hand over to Donna, um, but Sally will pick up those um, outstanding questions there, um, and obviously you can send extra through um, as needed. So let's move on to Donna's slides. There we go, Donna. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, Donna Nossi, Head of Quality and Improvement for Knotts and Nottinghamshire Clinical Commissioning Group. Um, I'd like to introduce to you a bit of an idea or a, a concept around a best practice guide for managing end of life care, particularly during the COVID-19 period, but also look into the future and about how and where we bring all of the end of life care work together into one place. You will have already heard today on this call that, you know, there's so much going on around end of life care and management. There are so many different components to the end of life care and management. Not all of it is new. We'll have heard about, you know, respect and gold standard frameworks and restore, which are not brand new to some, but actually there has been a refocused uh, purpose of some of this work to, to enable a much quicker pace and a much um, faster rollout of, towards implementation of some of the, the, the tools that we can use. So much variation across patches. So we do this in Nottingham City, we do this in Nottingham uh, North and East, we do something different in mid Not. So it just really makes it more important for us to have a bit more of an organised approach to end of life care and management, something that's a bit more coordinated and a little bit more consistent. So the idea really is to um, bring together all of the best practice guidance that is out there around end of life care and, and, and um, management. It's really to ease the pressures on staff it's to reduce the confusion and it's to support best practice so that we can get really max we can really maximize the benefits of all of the great work that's been done by loads of um really really clever and, and, and influential people it's about bringing it into a one place so that staff can use that as a quick reference guide or as a go-to place it's definitely not to reinvent the wheel you know we need to just pull it all together um to get the best um use of it I think what's really important to say also is that it wouldn't be mandatory. So this is not something that we'd say you have to do. It's something that you can choose to use. If you're already managing end of life care really, really well in your service, which we know some of you are, this is not going to be that beneficial to you. But there are some services that really need that extra um, support and um, help in getting this all right at the right time. We, the intention, as I said, is to save you time uh, for you and your staff. Instead of having to seek out what the best practice guidance is from lots of different places, it's all there in one place. I think it's also really important to say that it's not a done deal and it's not finished. And this, what you're seeing on the screen at the minute, is absolutely just completely draft. It, 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 it needs your expertise including into it. 
It can be used for home care and care homes. It's not specific to any particular organisation. It's just bringing in all of the resources together. What it looks like in the future, who knows? It could be a portal, it could be a website, it could be an app, it could be a document that we use. But these are all ideas that we can um, to work with to, to get the best resource. I'm not going to go through the detail of what you're seeing on the slide, but I think in summary, just to give you a flavour of some of the components that we could use, it, you know, it's things like um, what we've talked about today, verification of death, respect, restore, bereavement support, care after death, registration, certification, that type of thing, um, that all of the best guidance can go on, on, on this uh, sort of platform. And I know that everybody's busy and I know that we're all working super, super, super hard. But if anybody does have um, some spare capacity and wants to be involved in this work, please do let Becky know through the contacts at the end of the, the uh, session. And we will be in touch to form a bit of a working group and get that really right for everybody. Because, you know, what we want more than anything is to know that this is useful for you if this is not useful for you we don't need to be doing it but i know that i certainly from feedback that we've heard pre-covid end of life care was particularly an area that most care homes um, saw as a priority through other routes of work that we've done with you more than anything though and i really really want to stress this this is about what you need and getting it right for you so if this isn't right let us know but if it is let's let's go with it let's develop it let's create it but let's do it together thanks becky brilliant that's really helpful thank you very much uh, so there's a few questions um mainly around infection prevention and control i think so i think um sally's just working to kind of type the answers to those so i'll give her a little bit more time on that um, and we can come back to them if they're still outstanding by the Q&A session. Um, I'm going to hand over briefly to um, Tracy Madge now, who will just give you a, a, an overview of, of the support offer that we're developing. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's been a, a, a really welcome, um, all of that information, and I hope the um, people on the call also have found that quite useful. Looking at the polls, it seems that people are, are wanting more information. And um, I think just to... to to support what Donna's saying, this isn't us telling you what you need, it's you telling us what you need, it's the other way around. So the support offer that we've got really is, is around four main, main service planks, and that's around understanding that sort of who can I admit and who can't I admit, and the COVID issues around that, that's number one. The second is around uh, end of life, respect and restore tools that we can help with. The third is around the infection prevention and control with, with what, what you need to do in what scenario. And the fourth one I've picked up is around death verification. So we're, we are looking really hard about how we can pull something together that can support you that's coordinated. Um, I know from just reading the slides myself, it's a lot of information and I'm sure you're getting information overload from many different um, organisations and people. So what we're trying to do as a local NHS is support you to coordinate that. Uh, and we really enjoy your and appreciate your feedback. But I'd like to thank all of the speakers. I think they've done an amazing job. It's, we are new to the technology and uh, we're learning every day. And uh, I'm assuming you're new as well. But we can use this as a vehicle moving forward uh, if that's what people want. So thank you ever so much for your time. And I'll, I'll pass back to Becky. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. So we're just going to move on to our um, question and answer session now. So I've put the contact details up there if you want to take any of them down. Like I said earlier, we will be um, sharing all the slides uh, with everyone who's registered for these events, so you will get it. Um, we've got about 50 people with us at the moment, so that's really fantastic. So over the three days, I think we'll have um, sort of had contact with, with over 80 people, which, which I'm really, really pleased about. So a um, couple of questions then. So I'll put these out to the panel. Um, there's first question here is um, if elderly are not showing typical symptoms, would you advise, advise that community carers wear surgical masks and would these need changing after each service user and visors for all visits as a preventative? So that one's going to be out to you, Sally. So I, I think you're, you're probably busy typing up an answer at the moment, <laughs> aren't you? But <laughs> I'm, I'm actually answering this one. It's just that my typing skills are not that great. So um, right. I am working my way through that and I am just um, 
typing my answer, which is okay. that surg surgical masks should be worn um, and visors, goggles are needed in addition to this if there's direct um, care, so touching a person has been provided. Um, masks and visors can be used for a session, so they can be used for more than one person um, as they're not actually in direct contact with the um, patient. I do appreciate if you're getting into your car though, you can't really uh, wear a visor when you're driving around. So um, obviously that, if it's a reusable, I think we've already discussed that, will need to be um, cleaned. Um, so yeah. that's, I'm just in the middle of typing my answer. Brilliant, okay, that's great. So um, I'll just pop on to the, the last one here because the one in the middle is, is around um, PPE as well. So I'll give Sally a chance to get to that. Um, there's one here that says, uh, let's have a look. So when completing a respect for, oh, oh, that's, thank you. I think the panel are answering these as I'm trying to read them off. So um, that's great. Um, Sally, do you want to just answer some of these live then? Um, um, I can do and then I'll go back to finishing yeah. to type that one. So which one yeah. do you want me to? Um, so there's a question here. It says, if two or more are suspected, are you advising everyone else to isolate? So if you've got two or more residents with um, symptoms, which would be uh, would constitute a possible outbreak in a care home, um, obviously those two people will um, need to be isolated if that's possible to do so. And the advice would be then to contact um, Public Health England and organise um, for um, some swabbing to be done of those residents. Um, the advice at the, um, at the moment isn't that all the other residents would necessarily need to be isolated in that care home, um, but it very much depends on the situation really because um, obviously there's a lot of variation out there and I know that some homes are choosing to isolate um, other residents where we're able to um, and that's obviously down for local decision making and when if those two people that have um, got symptoms and or suspected of having COVID symptoms, if they're very difficult to isolate, it's how do you manage that within a care home? So if you're having to keep them to one area, but there are other people living in that area, it's how you manage that. So some of that is um, down to local decision making um, and obviously um, on an individual basis, I think care homes um, contact the team just so we can talk that through and, and provide that support where it's needed. That's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, there's another question here, Sally, and it says, can you go from a positive patient to a negative patient uh, with the same mask? So um, if you're uh, caring for patients and you're wearing masks, um, obviously for the purpose of wearing masks, we're not always sure who, who may be positive and who isn't negative. So the guidance that's come out is sort of based on around the fact that we think there may be more positive people out there than we maybe first thought. Um, and so the so in care homes you can wear um, a mask um, and you can wear visor as well and you can go to another patient. Now if you're wearing these uh, pieces of equipment and you're leaving rooms and you're going to somebody else you won't have your gloves and rapings on, you will have done your hand hygiene, and it's really important that you don't touch those masks and those visors. So those masks and visors won't come into contact with, the, with your next patient, but you may well touch those um, when you're moving around, and that's, that's the thing that you have to be really careful that you don't touch your um, mask or visor because that is potentially um, contaminated. Uh, and, and again, that's why if you're going somewhere else, the first thing you would do is do hand hygiene again. Um, and it is doing those regular hand hygiene steps to try and make sure that if you did accidentally touch something, that you are then doing hand hygiene before you put your clean PPE on and before you go into that next, that next person. So I hope that helps. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much, um, Sally. So there's another question here that I'll put to the panel. It says, should we be accepting new residents with no tests and taking their word on their isolation prior to admission? So I'm assuming that that is rela relating to uh, residents in hospital that are coming out to be discharged to... Uh, Care homes, or it might be going back to home care as well. 
um, bit difficult to know really. So I, so I think it sounds like um, accepting new residents that haven't had a test but maybe that aren't coming from hospital so it could be either couldn't it? So if they're coming from hospital now they should be um, getting discharge testing which is just coming in um, but that's for residents going back to care homes. There isn't currently a process for residents going back to their own home with a care package to be tested. So it's a bit difficult to know. Um, but in regards to, oh, sorry, residents coming to residential home from, from their, their own, own home. home. Okay, so somebody coming in from their own home. Um, so if you're taking a new resident in, I think it's about asking a lot of questions around um, whether they've been, whether they're um, well, what symptoms they've got. I think if, uh, when they're coming into the home, the advice is to, um, similar to having somebody in from um, hospital really, is to isolate them for 14 days um, because, and that's based on the fact that they may not have any symptoms at the moment, but they could potentially be incubating an infection. So that would be the same as um, somebody coming from hospital that um, hasn't had COVID and um, that is testing negative, we would still say you would isolate them for 14 days because you don't know if they're incubating the infection. So they might be negative on the day the test is taken, but they could still be incubating the infection. So it's the same as if someone's coming in that hasn't been tested, you would still take those 14 days precautions um, okay. to make sure that the other residents in the home are protected in case they do come out with symptoms. All right, that's that's really helpful. Thank you. I'm just I'm just going to summarise what you said a little bit because it's it's complicated, isn't it? So I think the overall answer is is yes. Um, you can still admit um, residents coming from their own homes, but you need to follow a 14 day period of isolation of that resident. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, we've got another question that's just come in. Would you advise community carers to wear masks and visors? throughout the calls, even if the service users haven't got any symptoms? So it depends on the care that's been provided. Um, so I think if you follow the table that was on my on, on the presentation, if you're actually just going into someone's home and you're within two metres, but you're not actually going to be touching them, then that's a risk-based um, approach. I imagine that these people will be going in and actually providing some sort of direct care, in which case um, the advice is to wear um, personal protective equipment. So you would be wearing um, masks and um, you uh, would be wearing visors and um, eye protection goggles if they were symptomatic, so if they were coughing and they were just there. Even okay. if they haven't got symptoms, uh, if they haven't got symptoms, you would always wear um, a mask at the moment if you're doing direct care and um, goggles and uh, face protection is based more on if someone's symptomatic but I know some places are wearing um, those as well. Okay that's great thank you very much so uh, there's another question that's come in as well so where do we stand if our resident goes into hospital and on discharge they are tested positive do we have to accept them back if there are no symptoms in the home? The resident is mobile with some challenging behaviours and it would be difficult to isolate them in their bedroom. Okay, that's a really interesting question. Uh, so some local guidance was put together around this um, between the local infection control teams, Public Health England and the hospital. Um, because to address the, because um, I think there's been various guidance documents coming out around discharge and it wasn't wholly clear. And what we've agreed locally is that if, um, if there's a resident uh, that needs to come back to a home that has tested positive whilst they were in hospital, so they've maybe been in for quite a long time, they've not recently gone in from the home, so if they've just gone in from the home, the chances are that that um, transmission may have happened in the home. So if they've been in hospital for a while, they've test positive um, and the home that they came from hasn't currently got any COVID cases, then our advice at the moment is that that home is quite within their rights not to take that resident back um, because obviously we are trying to, where possible, keep the um, uh, homes with COVID outbreaks um, 
not to take back people that haven't currently got COVID. We are trying to prevent that sort of community transmission where we can. Um, now, if it's a large home and they feel that they are able to um, completely segregate this new person coming in and they feel that they have got facilities to be able to take that resident back safely, that will be um, with a discussion with their local infection control team um, and, and that will be a risk-based approach. So it's not a blanket you can't and if it's end of life we might work around that. So I think that's a case-by-case -case basis but, but no, if, if homes um, haven't got a COVID outbreak currently and they want been asked to take a COVID patient back, we would help support with them saying no if they didn't feel they're able to do that at this time. Okay, thank you, Sally. That's helpful. So there's a question here on respect. So I'll put this to um, Carl, or I think we've also got Jessica. Um, it says, oh, no, it's gone. It's gone. I think someone's typing the answer to that one. So, so you should get the answer to that really shortly. Um, okay. If anyone's got any more questions, then do send them through. So let me just check the time. We are... Well, we've got another 10 minutes left. So if you would like any other questions answering, then, then please do send those through. I'll just give everyone a few minutes. I'm going to put up a final poll. Uh, and this is a um, evaluation one. Um, so if you wouldn't mind filling that in, that would be really, really useful. I'll do that now. Uh, we've had a really, really good response to these polls, so thank you for taking part in them. It, it does really give us a lot of information. Uh, so here comes your, the final poll of today, and it's more just around um, whether or not you found the webinar useful. So if you can complete that for me, I'd be really grateful. Um, and just in these last few minutes, if you want to send some more questions through, the, the panel will stay in, in, until, um, until three o'clock, so use them while you've got them. Right, thank you. I can see people are starting to complete that poll. So that's that's great. Thank you. Brilliant. So I can see a few people are sort of suggesting a bit of a longer question and answer session, uh, which, um, you know, if we do some further of these webinars, we'd be happy to do. Oh, look, there's a question come in. That's wonderful. Is there training available for completing respect forms and how we could access this? Right, so I'll put that out to the panel. If you want to answer live, that would be really good. Oh, someone can't see the poll. I get a different view to you guys. So mine just pops down from the top. Um, would anyone like to answer the question? On? Oh, Carl. Yeah, brilliant. So if you want to uh, answer that for me, Carl, that would be really great. Are you on uh, mute, Carl? Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was trying to get on. Um, there will be training available. Um, uh, it will be more around uh, supporting care homes in um, working with residents around identifying patients that need respect forms. Um, I, and again, I would advocate downloading the, uh, the app uh, around respect. There's lots and lots of fantastic mat uh, training materials on there um, that, uh, that really walk you through that. And again, I've put some um, uh, slides as an appendices to, to the slides that have gone out today. Um, about how to complete the respect form again so that goes through that step by step section by section so uh, I hope that's okay. Yeah that's great thank you very much. Anyone want to send in a last minute question? Uh, I think if I don't get if I don't get any uh, any more questions in the next couple of minutes then then we'll draw to a close. Um, uh, um, uh, Becky people are saying they can't see the poll. Uh, right okay so mine drops down from the top so i just have to move my mouse there i think sometimes you know if you don't if you come off full screen so if you minimize your screen you can see the pop-ups a little bit easier that might be worth a try okay uh oh bless you i know i think this is the million dollar question isn't it when will covid 19 go away um I think Hi, sorry, I can't answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think we would all say the same. Uh, right, so there's another question here. Um, 
is the uh, webinars going to continue after COVID for training purposes? I, I mean, I think if, if um, doing webinars in, in this sort of style is useful to everyone, um, then we would be happy to facilitate this. Um, I think part of that will be about the feedback that we get. I don't know if you want to come in on that, Donna. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, what we do uh, ordinarily in pre-COVID times is the um, quarterly care home forums. And actually, you know, that involves tra travelling to and from venues, it involves paying for venues. Actually, this platform would be ideal for that type of um, forum to continue into the future. Assuming that everybody is, um, you know, on board with that and prefers this, it, it could be an, an addition to the face to face sessions. Um, but certainly uh, the use of technology, particularly in this way, is something that we will all be considering in the future as, a, as a, a new and improved way of working. So I certainly think that this could be used for engaging more with care homes and home care um, in the future. Brilliant. Thank you, um, Donna. I think I'd absolutely agree with that. We've all had to embrace new technology. Um, none of us are um, technology wizards here, but we seem to have managed OK with this um, this format. So I, I think I think this is something that's likely to continue. Um, another question come in. Can you advise on testing um, of care staff? Uh, I'm aware of a home that has four positive. Um, the staff have been advised to purchase their own PPE and that they will not be testing the staff. Does anyone want to come in on that for me? Hi, it's Sally. So, um, yeah, so um, that's quite concerning. So I don't know if that person wants to um, get in touch with me after this webinar and we can just talk through this, but certainly um, uh, there is testing for staff so that has been set up and there is a number that home can use and there is locally there is a testing station that is um, in Beeston and staff are able to book on and get tested so getting staff tested shouldn't be an issue um yeah no that's, in that's helpful to purchasing their own PPE um, staff should not be needing to do that so if that's a care home that hasn't got the correct PPE in use there are um, uh, there are um, things that we can do about that if, I, if we can find out which home this is. So I don't know if somebody wants to um, get in touch with me after this. And uh, What's your email? Um, so if they um, send it to um, M M A C C G, so that stands for Mansfield and Ashfield, C C G, M A C C G dot I P C, so Infection Prevention and Control, at nhs.net and i'll pick that up okay yeah, that's that's brilliant thank you so um i've put my contact details on the screen as well so so if you haven't had a chance to write that down if it comes to me or sally then i'll make sure it, it, it gets to sally okay um so there's another question that sorry go on no yeah you i was going to say the questions come in yeah uh, and it says where do we stand if staff refuse to wear masks Right, so if staff, it depends, um, depends on the situation really, if this is just for, uh, so they're in the home and they're within two metres of residence but they're um, not actually doing direct care, um, then I think it's, it, well, it's down to the manager of the home really to determine what's, what, what they require in their home um, and if staff are um, refusing to wear masks then I think it's a similar process to why they're refusing to do other things that um, the home requires them to do. So that would be <coughs> taking them through the usual routes for that. Um, the masks where it's not in relation to direct care are actually to protect the uh, worker. But I think if, um, if this is in relation to people doing direct care for people, so they're actually touching people, then they do need to be wearing masks. And actually I think that's, um, that's uh, probably a management decision really that needs to um, uh, put into pro in process there really. Okay, that's uh, really helpful. Um, I can't see at the minute if there's any other questions that have come in because my... Just one moment. Oh no, there we go. Um, oh, it says there, are, dis are disclaimers a good idea? Um, it's my understanding that they have no legal uh, binding um, uh, disclaimers are, are not legally binding, but Donna may know more. 
Yeah, absolutely that. They're not legally binding. I think they do support um, care home managers to understand the situation at the time. Um, but they are not, they're not legally binding no matter what agreement that you have at, at the time. Uh, are we talking about, uh, just to clarify, I suppose, um, it depends what the disclaimer is about as well. So what, you know, what is the situation that the disclaimer is referring to? If this is about um, saying to staff, um, you know, you know all the risks, you know, but you're choosing not to um, do the recognised practice and, and sign here to say that you accept all the risks, you know, it's better than nothing, but it, exactly as Trace said, it's not legally binding. Fabulous, thank you. Right, so we've got we've got two minutes left, so we'll just hang around. And, oh no, no, it's it, time's flown. So it's three o'clock now. Uh, we've got no no open questions. Um, the poll results are all in, so I'll wrap it up here then. Thank you everyone for um, attending, and uh, that's that's the attendees and the panelists. It's been really great. Thank you for all taking part and and sending through your questions and doing those polls for us. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna end here, um, and uh, here we go. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.